Okay, good to be back, uh, back with you. Um, we, we had 16 failures written down. We made it through seven. And uh, so we have a few more to go. And I, I told my wife, I said, well, obviously the Lord wants to use our failures, failures more than the things that we did, uh, we did right. So we, we do want to finish going through that list uh, before we get to the uh, second session, which is about God's faithfulness uh, in, in our fruitfulness, the things that God blessed in spite of, in spite of who we are. And so we'll just kind of pick up in the list, uh, right, right where we, uh, right where we left off. I, I, I am, I am thankful. I want to say thanks again, just for taking the time uh, to come on a Saturday like this. There's lots of things going on. And I, I remember even when, when Deb and I were parenting, you know, and they would, th- th- there wasn't a lot of this to be honest with you, but a couple of times it was like, man, I'm just too tired. I'm just not do it. And I missed out on a blessing. And so hopefully this will be a blessing. I listened in on parts of a couple of the uh, uh, sessions, um, the breakout sessions, and it was just such a blessing. And it's very obvious uh, God wants to uh, use our failures. So we're going we're gonna to start right back in here on the list, and we'll go down through. We'll try to go a little bit faster here. We do have some things that we think could be of value to you if you could just learn, learn from our mistakes or learn from my mistakes. So uh, I think, is this right where we left off? I, th- I think the, the, uh, the next one is not setting boundaries or not enforcing boundaries. The, this is uh, uh, something that's kind of been talked about. It's probably been talked about in the sessions. Uh, Deb and I have probably uh, t- touched on this. Um, and I'm not saying that you would do this, but we bump into parents and really in counseling, we see this a lot where we, we want our child just to choose the way they're going to go. We want our child to choose their friends. We want them to have the freedom to choose their religion. Uh, we don't, you know, we, 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 we just, we want to, you know, give them a little bit of guardrails and, and we're saying, no, if you, if you love your kids, you're responsible for setting boundaries enforcing boundaries. And this really goes back to those three things about clarity of conviction, consistency of consequence, and charity uh, in, in, uh, in communication. Our kids need, need ditches. They need to know, here's the road. There's a little leeway on that road as you're traveling through life and you're making a decision. This is a ditch and this is a ditch. And we're going to help you avoid these ditches. Now, if you, if you go around us and, and kids will, and if you uh, choose a path where you, you would be disobedient to Deb and I, and they did, uh, then you're going to get in the ditch. But when I stand before God, I'm not going to have to explain about how the parent let that child get in that ditch. So I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to uh, give boundaries. And Deb and I um, are both witnesses to this. Now, having gone down the road farther than you, um, th- that's how we see this. We're just down the road farther than you. We can tell you uh, uh, what uh, what off ramps to take on the highway. We can tell you. I, I use this illustration. We can tell you where the gas stations are with the stinky bathrooms and the ones just keep traveling ten more miles. You find a nice clean bathroom. Amen, ladies. Yes, and uh, and so that's how we we see it in life. Our kids are old enough where we're hearing them say to us. Thanks for having that boundary in our life. Even though we pushed against it, sometimes we disobeyed it. A thank you so much for caring enough about us that you had those boundaries. We counsel, we counsel kids, young people, whose parents didn't care. And their life is a train wreck because of it. So, so that, that would clearly uh, be one. Here's, here's one that I need to speak to uh, so busy providing for them, you don't have time for them. Um, this, this, is, this is my greatest regret, really, really as a follower of Christ. When I, when I stand before the Lord, it's not going to be a chew-out session. My sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. But when I, when I see the Savior, I see the beauty in his face, I see the grace one of the things that's going to make me fall down is where I failed in, in this area. I just, it was a clear area. I was, I was busy providing, and we were trying to think. For sure, the first 10 years of our parenting, um, I was working about 65 to 75 hours a week. And, and literally, 
from just being tired from that, but just not being involved. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. And, and I remember it was a dagger in my heart. We were going to Sailorville Baptist Church. I was a deacon in the church. I'd have a deacon meeting. The deacon's meeting started at nine. Um, the young adults uh, class, well, actually, it was a young marriage class, um, family, and I was actually teaching the class. We had a Saturday event where we were going to, with a father-son event, where we were going to make kites, actually build them, and then fly them. And I remember I couldn't get off work. Saturdays was a big deal. And I had to ask Joe Funkhauser, Ben's here, I had to ask Joe Funkhauser, my friend, if he would take my two sons to this event. And I can remember being at work and thinking, what in the world am I doing here? And I know sometimes it's not possible. You can't be at everything. Uh, but that, that, event, that event really got me. I remember another time my uh, son Jake was on a, on a little league team here in Ankeny. And I had to work on Saturdays. So I had a, and it was a big deal. So I, there, he had a game. I snuck away for an hour from work. I had an assistant manager running the desk. I, I come to see his game, stay for a couple innings. I got to get back. I'm in a suit and tie and uh, get, get back to the office. And the owner was there and he was wanting to know where I'd been. And, um, and I said, well, my son had a little league game and I wanted to go over. I mean, it just kills me to even say this. Think about this. And I just, you know, I snuck over for a couple innings. And he made a statement. Um, I should have quit on the spot, but he made a statement. He said, well, you're going to have to choose your priorities. Is it going to be family or is it going to be work? And I remember telling my wife, you remember me coming yeah. home? Yeah. She's like, well, what'd you tell him? <laughs> I remember what I told him. You do not want me to make that choice. Do not ask. I'm already by the hours I'm putting in, made the choice. You don't want me to verbalize that. And um, so, so busy providing for them, which is a good thing. That is a good thing. Satan takes a good thing and turns it into a less than perfect thing. So busy providing for them, you don't have time for them. You will, you will not regret the time you spend uh, with your kids, just absolutely. Okay, uh, next one on the list. Outsourcing your children's child spiritual formation to the church. It's been mentioned numerous times already. Uh, Deb, Deb and I have, have, uh, have mentioned that just as a pastor visualizing parents dropping kids off. Uh, if I had Pastor Tony up here, he would tell you the youth group, you know, even our own parents from, our, from, from Lakeside Fellowship here, it's like, well, that's Tony's job to teach them. No reinforcement whatsoever, you know, uh, are, are very, very minimal. So, so you are wrong. If you, I mean, our job is to come alongside the parents. But Pastor Tony, if he was here as our youth leader, you'd say it's almost, it's almost hard to do that because the parents have to want you to come alongside them. Like, it's not uncommon for a, a, a Christian home, for, for, for dad especially, to not be involved in their life. And it's really, that's the youth groups. He feels the heavy weight of it being the, I think in that yeah, outsourcing, ahead. I think in that outsourcing, your child's spiritual formation also can be Christian school. Um, and, and while you may look at this statement and go, Obviously, this is true. I cannot outsource. I can't hold the church and this Christian school fully responsible to teach my child all that they need to know about God and um, living for the Lord. It's easy to know that, but yet to still fall into this pitfall of um, thinking it's all covered. It's covered. I've got them going to youth group. I've got them attending church. I've got them in a Christian school. So you think you have your bases covered. Um, so without even thinking about that, that's what you're doing. You are outsourcing your child's spiritual formation to the church. You're entrusting it completely to someone else. Yeah. And in the part that I sat in on pastor Jason's, he, he talked about Christian school, uh, homeschool, public school. And Deb and I did, did all three. And uh, sometimes it depended on the child, depended on what the school situation was. And, and even my, my, my son, Jake, you can, you can be in a Christian school environment and learn the worst version of Christianity ever and make friends that, 
you know, that, 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 that those kids don't all know the Lord. And even if they knew the Lord, they're, they're being formed. And so just to think that, well, I'm going to, well, Lakeside has a great youth group, and, and, and we do. Well, that, that checks that box. And I, well, they go to Christian school or, or home school, that checks that box. That is, that is absolutely, um, that is absolutely uh, not, not the case. Uh, reacting to things uh, in the moment. I'll let Deb kind of speak to this uh, just a little bit. And... Uh, so um, one of the things that I learned in reading that book, Age of Opportunity, 25 plus years ago, um, was the Band-Aid and Quick Fix um, Correction and Discipline. Um, I didn't realize that that's what I was doing, but up until that point, so at that time that I read that book, I had my oldest walking into his teen years, um, so I had kids from 3 to 11, and I realized as I read this book, oh my goodness, I have been doing this all wrong. Um, but the Band-Aid and Quick Fix Correction is, um, it's, it's treating the correction and my child's behavior as an inconvenience to me. So I want a quick fix solution that makes my life easier because this has been a disruption. Um, so um, just for my own help, um, the, the Band-Aid and Quick Fixes don't, um, address their heart issue. It doesn't point out their sin in this situation. So one example is you have two children fighting over a toy. You walk into the room and you say, well, who had it first? That's a Band-Aid. That's a quick fix because the fight is an inconvenience to me. I just want it to go away. It's not addressing the selfishness of their hearts um, and in consideration for anyone else, just it's just focused on what they want right now. Um, one way in which I realized I was doing this was I would give my children ultimatums. Ultimatums are a Band-Aid. They're a quick fix because I give them two choices, one I know they're not going to want and the one that I want them to choose. So like uh, dinner time and there's green beans, you will eat your green beans or you will go to bed. And my first four children would eat the green beans. They would take the ultimatum I wanted them to choose. Member number five was the stubbornly strong-willed child. And so I would give him the ultimatum that worked with the first four. And he would say, okay, good night, see you in the morning. And he would literally skip down the hallway to his room. And I'd be like, yeah, that wasn't what I wanted. But I'm a slow learner, so I just changed the ultimatum. You will eat the green beans, or you will get spanked. Okay. And he jumps up, runs over to the drawer, gets the wooden paddle, brings it to me. Like, okay. I'm learning slowly that ultimatums is a, is a quick fix. It's a Band-Aid. It doesn't address the heart. It just gives a quick fix so that my life isn't inconvenienced. I want you to use this because you're just... Um, I, I would just add one thing. Uh, that, that child wasn't necessarily the smartest either because one time he went and got the paddle and he told his mom, you're going to need this today. So, he did. I don't know. I always figured I was smarter than that. He was three years old when he said that. Yeah. Yeah, three years old. You're going to need this today. I said, honey, apparently put a little more swing into that thing. No. <laughs> don't let that go outside of the room here. Okay. Not limiting screen time and technology. I just want to say a couple of things about this. And uh, to me, this is the flashing red, yellow, any color of light that is in the Christian community. It's amongst the adults. It's a, our problem. It transfers to our kids. What we do a little bit, our kids are always going to do in excess. And, uh, and so not, not, not saying no to this. Now, let me just, these are... These are 2,023 statistics. I'm, there could be a, a billion of these. Let me give you a couple of them. The average teen spends seven hours and 22 minutes looking at screens in a day. That's 43% of their waking hours. In 2015, it was five hours. So just in the last eight years, it's gone up 40%. 
Teenage boys average one hour more per day than girls. That was a surprise to me. Uh, and I think it's because of gaming. Three hours are spent watching TV or videos per day of this. Uh, gaming, almost two hours a day, average teenager. And social media, right at two hours a day. Uh, their social media, number one, TikTok, number two, Snapchat, number three, Instagram, and a distant, 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 distant fourth is Facebook. And um, what, what we see in counseling is the effects of screen time, the ability to see. I mean, if I wanted to, before I came to know Christ, if I wanted to see pornographic material at my age, I had to drive to another town to like a 7-Eleven gas station, hope the person didn't thought that I was over 18 years old and go up and buy a magazine. We, we provide this to our kids. Pastor Tony gets asked the question all the time, when do you think my kids are going to start looking at pornography? When are they going to be exposed to it? And his answer is absolutely honest. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely the moment you give them a phone. It doesn't take weeks. And so, so we have to figure this out. And it's a real thing. And again, this goes back to the very first one, about you're expecting more from your children than you're doing in your own life. So, I mean, your, your iPhone, you could look on there, go a couple of weeks, uh, d don't start World War II at your house and switch phones with your, with, with your spouse. See, see what your screen time is just on your phone. That's not talking about TV and everything else. And you would, seven hours and 22 minutes for the average. That means they're not outdoors. They're not, you know, doing these kind of things. So, so to me, this is like the, it's not even an elephant in the room anymore. I mean, it's a huge thing. And, and to some degree, we're going to stand before God and give an account of, you know, we're, we're Eli. We're telling our kids, you shouldn't be doing that so much. You shouldn't be doing that so much. But, you know, at some point, we have to step in and do something about this, um, I don't know if you have anything there or not. Yeah, I just wanted to share, you know, when we were raising we'll our right when we were raising our five kids, um, there was not the just multitude of social media platforms that are out there now. Um, none of our kids had phones. Um, well, I shouldn't say none. Um, our youngest two may have had phones before they left home from school from growing up. But the older three never had phones. Um, we only had one computer in the house, and that was in the family room, so that the, just the public area of it would give accountability to what they were doing on it. But even in that, our children not having phones, and, and back then, what was the social media? It was, you've got mail and MySpace. Um, so we're talking a long time ago. Um, but even in that, um, with the very limited social media available to them, um, we still had two sons get involved with pornography. So you cannot be careful enough. Deb and I were sitting in a living room when we lived in a house in Sailorville. I remember looking right at Deb. She was across the living room. I was sitting in a couch right here. One of our sons was just on the family computer that was out in the public, just around the corner. Mom and dad in the living room. And he walked between Deb and I, and a piece of paper fall, fell out of his back pocket. He was just walking. Deb's right there. And Deb had a very sheltered life. I did not have the sheltered life. The piece of paper, I was just going to actually be kind for my son, pick it up. And it was folded four ways. I'm looking at it through the backside of the paper, I opened it up, and it was a, he had printed off four images, and it fell out of his pocket. Deb goes, what's that? I go, you don't want to know what that is. I said, come here, son. And we went in and had a nice little conversation. <laughs> but so what, what we're trying to say is the technology wasn't nearly available like it is today. Uh, the little bit of technology we did have, we tried to have it in a public area. Your kids are sinners. And they're going to, water seeks its own level, it finds its own path. That sinful heart will figure out a way 
So, so clearly a boundaries, clearly be involved, clearly. The, the four pastors at Lakeside Fellowship, on my phone, I have an accountability software. It doesn't stop my phone from going anywhere. But if it goes anywhere that is off, off of the main road, if it's in any ditch, uh, Pastor Joel is my accountability partner. He, call, he, gets a, he gets a text message immediately and he calls me up. I'm 62 years old, the father of five children that are grown, married 40 years, and 16 grandkids, and I'm going to have accountability on my phone. Do you see what I'm saying? And so this is, this is, uh, this is where the devil is smiling right, right here. I mean, I, I, we could just keep talking about that, but it's... Um, Okay, we're, 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 we're rounding in to, to the end here. I think we could just have four left. But holding low spiritual expectations. Uh, Deb and I talked about this. So, so um, what you want to do is you want to pray for your kids to be all that God wants them to be. And so when you have low spiritual expectations, you're not having them read about missionaries who gave their life. You're not letting them see that you're sacrificing, that you love Christ. You're not, you're not talking about Christ and the people in the church. You're not doing things. You're, you have a low, the, 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 the bar is let's go to church. Let's kind of be involved at church. Let's make sure our kids don't embarrass us. But, but like just having a low spiritual expectation, don't. Like, like, we're not talking about rules here. We're talking about what do you dream for your kids? What do you want for them? Because as, as that is real in your life, that, they'll, they'll catch that. They'll, they'll find out what you get excited about for them. So we're just, we're just saying one of the things that, that we, we, we wish we had even had done more. Like our, fa- our church family here is really good about it. We're trying to expose the kids to missions trips and, you know, just like let them know about the world out there, the lost world and, and how, yes, kid, you're being raised in Polk City or Sailorville or when we were up in Algona, but this isn't what the real world is like out there. Um, we're richer than 99% of the world and you should have a taste of it. Just like, like, like just believe big things for your, for your kids when it comes to the uh, spiritual realm. Did I say that enough? Okay. Um, I'll be very careful here, but one of the mistakes that we see parents make is trying to be your child's best friend. Now, l- let, me, let me explain that just a little bit. You are the God-given authority for your child's life, okay? And as they're getting older, and especially as they're moving into the 15, 16, you know, as they're, as they're, so this is age-graded, um, you, you should, it should grow from a, I'm telling you what you're going to believe, this is why you believe it, here are the rules, Okay, you're going to be in a situation where you can make a mistake, and I, I don't want my kids going off to college or living by themselves, making their first big decision in life, and that got that got talked about. Um, um, but but here's this is just a thing with me. So if it's totally wrong, just disregard it. Come tell me later. One of the things, and and maybe you do it. I don't know anybody here. And again, this is just me, and I don't even know if it bothers Deb as. Uh, Calling your little children, oh, girlfriend, you stop that. Now, I understand that language, okay? I, I don't know what you mean by it. But the reality is you're their authority. And yes, you want to be a friend, but, but it's not, you can take friendship with them and wanting them to like you. And my parents never let me did, do this, so, so my children are going to uh, grow up to really love mom and dad, and they want to hang around with mom and dad, and I get all that. But there has to be, they have to know you're the authority. Because in the sovereignty of God, the dads are the picture of God the Father. And, and there has to be, for their benefit, there has to be... Um, there, there has to, they have to know you're the authority uh, that that God um, that God has given them. Do you anything more there? Or you're good. Okay. okay, that was kind of my thing there. So this would go along with it. Uh, one of the failures that we see, and and maybe we were guilty of this, is giving your giving your child almost everything they ask for, never saying no, or hardly ever saying no. It's okay. Let me just ask you, as, a, as adult parents, do you get everything you want? 
Wives, do you get everything you want? Tell what, what's the word? No. Um, man, I, I, if you're counseling at all, you get, you get, you get adults who their parents never said no to them. They're, 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 they're the, they're almost the worst adults in the world to be around. They, they, they just assume everything is going to be a yes. And so giving your child almost everything they ask for, it is painful in the moment to say no. It's painful in the moment to say no when some other parent said yes. It's painful in the moment because it's so much easier, you know, to say yes. But so, and you want to you want to choose wisely. You don't want to be a no person all the time. You want to be known for what you're against. Uh, but giving your child almost everything they ask for is a strategy for disaster. And then, and then we'll just. We, we cut some out, but for your benefit, we're, we're down to number 16, praise the Lord. Um, forgetting the joy of childhood and the excitement of new discoveries. And I'm going to let, Deb and I talked about this, I'm going to let her, her talk about, well, what, what do we mean by, as parents, one of the mistakes we made is the joy of childhood and excitement of new discoveries, and, and we, f- we forget that we should let a child be a child a little bit here. So go ahead. And- yeah. I think in this area where what we were really thinking on was um, we like to do everything for our children. We like to make it easy for them. Uh, We don't like to see them struggling, and so we step in. Um, But one of the greatest joys of childhood is when they realize they did something on their own. Um, How many, I I always cringe when I see this, um, but some parents buy their children Legos and the parents put it together for them. I, I, I just struggle with that. I'm like, no, that's part of the joy is they learn how to follow the directions. They learn how to create it on their own. Um, so just realize that many times when we step in, we are um, robbing our children of that joy of accomplishment and new discoveries. Um, so a lot of times it's just keeping life a little bit more simple. Um, we don't have to be entertaining our children. Um, so kind of that thought in there as well. Yeah, and, and you know, I wrote in, in the note for me is just because your child says they're bored doesn't mean you have to swoop in and keep them busy. I mean, when I was growing up as a kid, and again, this isn't just like, oh, those were the glory days, nothing like that. But, you know, we'd, we'd ride bikes in the neighborhood or whatever we do. We'd try to figure out a pickup game or, you know, we, we, we'd try to, but, but my mom, like, she wouldn't let us just sit at the TV and just watch sports. Like, no, I, today's a nice day. I want you to be outside. I want you doing something. And, and we, we want our kids to, you know, God has this beautiful creation out there. Like, let them be children as long as they can, you know, it's a tough old world they're walking into. You know that. But just don't forget the joy of childhood and the excitement of new discoveries and give your kids opportunities. Now, Here's where we would have ended the first section. So, so evaluate yourself. Like take it easy. You could add more failures. You could, you could say these three apply to us. These 10 don't, whatever that is. Um, what if you say, wow, I'm failing as a parent. Well, that's not the purpose of this. This, this isn't a beat down thing. I mean, we're just, we're just saying, man, if you could learn something from us, now, we say that to the kids all the time. I know, son, I don't want you to follow my path. Well, they're really young, and so, but we're adults here, so you should be able to learn from, from our mistakes. But, but if you say, okay, there are some things that are either a part of our parenting that are wrong or we've done in the past are wrong. So, so here are three words I want you to, three phrases I want you to write down, three steps, okay? Let me give them to you. I don't have them up here on the screen. They're gonna be really simple. So I failed as a parent. Maybe it's an area, maybe I could have done better, whatever it is. Uh, Number one, repent where necessary to those whom necessary. So so if your husband and wife, you say, okay, I I didn't uphold you, dear, in this, and I was going through that. Um, The the greatest thing to do, so repent where necessary. Now notice the second, to those whom necessary. Some of you, and again, this is age graded. You have to be wise with this. Some of you need to going to go ask your kids for forgiveness. Yeah, like you, you haven't been the model for them. You, you haven't been, you know, whatever that is. I'm, I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying 
Anytime you say, okay, what I've done in the past was not what God wanted, then repentance is a part of that. Number two, the word is reorder your personal life along biblical principles. Like you could leave today, and as you're either driving home, or maybe even better, let this, uh, let this simmer just a little bit, go on a date night or whatever, and just talk about what are ways, honey, that we could reorder the way that we're parenting, not to make our kids think we flew off a cliff or something, all of a sudden everything's completely changed, but just reorder your personal parenting along biblical principles. And then number three, and this would give Deb and I the greatest joy, remember your children are a blessing and a gift from God. Like, like just... Like, go away from spending some hours on parenting, say, Lord has blessed me with these kids, and I get so bogged down in the mire of parenting and, you know, changing diapers and them disobeying and crying at the, long, the, the wrong time and all this. Remember that they're a blessing and a gift, and, and on the difficult parenting, this too shall pass. There, there's a huge blessing that Deb and I, we're going to talk about here in just a second, that we are reaping, not because we are perfect parents, but because we were in the game. Like we were in there doing it to the best of our ability. Failed, yes, but your children are a blessing. They're given to you by God. And someday in your life, you're going to reap the reward. That's what Psalm 127 says. You will reap the reward of your children. I know Deb had a couple things and I'll, then I'll pray and that's that session and then we'll, we'll just go into a couple things that we did right. Um, remember that you as a parent are God's tool um, to help shape your children's heart. And remember this, there is no perfect parent, there is no perfect child, there's only a perfect God. We sang um, at the start of today, we sang that, that song that has the chorus, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Yeah, praise the Lord. So let me just have a word of prayer. And then we want to talk about, and I don't know if there's a handout for you, but please take notes. We want to talk about God's faithfulness that produce fruitfulness. So let, let me pray. Father, thanks again. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm thankful that somehow all five of my, our children are alive and have a relationship with you. And um, they, they survived our parenting. And uh, thank you for your grace and your mercy all the way along. Uh, your, in, your, your gift of courage and endurance. Lord, I pray your richest. Deb and I pray. pray. Uh, Greg and Laura, uh, Jason and Leah, we, we pray your blessing on each one uh, being here today. In Christ's precious name, amen. Okay, so here's what we want to do. Just for the, we got about 25 minutes we want to talk about God's faithfulness. The first one was in our failures, and now God's faithfulness produces our fruitfulness. So we want to talk about that for a moment, and I just want to remind you of a couple of things from this morning. So the goal of parenting, then, is to glorify God by guiding your children to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, setting them on a path to maturity in Christ's likeness. And then for me, this has really helped me to think, okay, there's three kind of areas, there could be more, but in my parenting, there's clarity of convictions. Okay, what are the convictions that my wife and I agree upon that, that, that are non-negotiables, they're good, they're a blessing? Uh, what is the consistency? Age graded, what would be the consequence? What's a measurable response that would be honoring to God if they violate a clear conviction? And, uh, and then, uh, Lord, help me. Instead of to react in the moment, uh, to react in anger, help me to have a charity, a, a gospel centeredness as I as I as I communicate. Uh, just one thing on, on on this right here: consistency of consequences, clarity of conviction. Um, we're gonna we're gonna do a breakout about rebellion. Uh, our our son Jake is gonna join us and just talk about he, for a couple years. While I was pastoring in Algona, uh, you know, the word I would use is he was off the reservation for a while. And we had another son, our son Josh. And he's, the, the blessing of this is that he's a pastor today. But when he got off to go to college, he made 
Uh, he was the people pleaser, and he made some huge, bad, major, unbelievable decisions. I mean, way bad. Um, supposed to be in school at UNI. Uh, we get something in the mail. It's like he hasn't showed up for anything. And one day I went looking for him. The school had a, even though we were on parent loans, the school had a privacy thing. They couldn't tell us anything about our son. And I'm telling him at the school, I'm paying for this. What do you mean? It's my son. He's right, you know, well, he's, you know, he's 18, so he can't. So I had to hunt to find him. And so I found out through a series of questions and talking to people on campus. He's working at this place. So I go go into this place and, you know, is, this, is, is my son working here? And it's like, well, yeah. And well, we can't really tell you. Well, is he going to, well, you might, the, the person says, you might come around four o'clock and maybe you'd see him. And he was trying to tell him. So I waited and it was pouring. My son had made so many bad decisions. He was walking to work in a dead, he was soaked. And I was parked right there. I said, son, I want you to get in the car. He broke down crying. And I was like, what is going on? And he was just broken. And so I went in and told the person he's, he's not going to be working here anymore and brought him back home. Well, brought him home and he was thankful for that. So, okay, I know you're 18, maybe 19. Um, you're coming back to our house. We have house rules, Okay. You've been making some bad decisions, and so you're an adult. We'll treat you like an adult. But if you're going to be out after 11 o'clock, I'm not going to tell you when you have to come in. You're an adult. But you're going to call me and let me know because your mom is not going to go to sleep until she knows where you're at. That's because she's the mom. And this is our house, and you're not doing that to my wife. This is like, okay. So we go a couple weeks. Things are going good. He comes in at midnight or whatever one night, didn't call. I said to, to him, son, what was the rule? They're like, I know, I should. Okay, there's not going to be a, the next time. I mean, we had to get, we had to, he, he needed to know there was an authority. Next time, it's pack the bags. You're, you're not, you're not going to be living. We have house rules. You have to respect them. And sure enough, a couple weeks later, came home about, I don't know, 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. And... Um, I, I didn't say anything to him that night. Got up in the morning, waited for him. He was staying downstairs. I said, pack your bags, son. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, you, you violated the rule. Apparently, this, um, this moment of grace that's been extended to you, you have uh, not appreciated it, and this, your mom's upstairs crying. But he goes, I have nowhere to go. I said, you know what? You should have thought about that. This is tough. He wanted to be here today. He can't. He's, he's a pastor today. And he wanted, to, he wanted to say to all of us that that was the moment that God used, like, what am I doing with my life? And he looks back at that moment as like a moment of salvation for him as far as from his life turning around. And so, so I don't say these things lightly and everybody's got to figure out their, I'm not saying kick kids out or, or doing that, but, but there comes a time where where you, you clearly it's your home you're going to stand before God for your home you see what i'm saying um and so just just figure out where that's at okay so let's let's uh oh so Deb, why, tell them about our four tell them about our failures in parenting and how God has somehow <laughs> mixed all those ingredients up and something turned out right tell tell them about it just a little bit there so uh, the title of this session, I just love, God's faithfulness produces our fruitfulness. It's not us. Yeah. It's totally God. So with all of the things that we went through today, all four of our sons are in full-time Christian service. And our daughter is a graphic designer and does graphic design work uh, for her church, as well as some other churches in the Engage Network um, so really, they all are using their gifts and abilities to serve the Lord, and that's that's God's work in their lives. Yeah, so we're we're thankful for that. Okay, Psalm one twenty eight. I've got it up here on the screen. Um, I, I don't know if they if they printed it or not. If you have a copy, but I'm gonna have my wife read Psalm one twenty eight. Now it's a song of ascent. Solomon didn't write this, um, 
but it has a couple of beautiful principles that we just want to share with you, and then we'll share the, the list of things that we did right is a lot shorter than the things we did wrong, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll be able to end on time here. But let's read Psalm 128. I'll, I'll have Deb read it. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like an olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Okay, Psalm 128 is the ideal, okay? Obviously, we don't live in an ideal world, and I don't, does anybody here want to come up here and say they have an ideal family situation going on? Like ideal parenting, ideal kids? No. So it's the ideal. But it, but it doesn't hurt to look, look at what the ideal is. And I just want to point out a couple of things from the psalm, then we'll give you this uh, short, short little list. So, blessed is everyone, verse 1, who fears the Lord. So the fear of the Lord could be a number of things, but generally it's a healthy respect and reverence for God. It stems from who God is and what God has done. So, so blessed is the parenting that has a healthy reverence uh, and respect for who God is. And the crucial need, uh, again, for every parent is to trust God personally. So that's what it's talking about. It's talking about a personal relationship. Your kids are going to see that they're in an environment where God is respected. God is reverenced. However, that works itself out. And I just want you to notice, so it talks about the father uh, in, a, in a couple of verses, puts the emphasis on him. It does talk about the wife in verse 3. It talks about the children of mom and dad in verse 3. And then it talks about the grandchildren uh, in, uh, in, in, verse, in verse 6. And so here's the idea of Psalm 128. It's like a still pond. You throw a pebble out into the middle of the pond. It has a ripple effect. The first ripple is fathers and husbands, and then wives and mothers, and then children, and then children's children. So I'll just show you a, a picture of our family again. So it's Deb and I. We, we have a life that is flawingly committed to serve in the Lord, making, making God big. And then we, so Deb and I are on the same page in this. Many of the years, uh, she had known the Lord for 10, well, 10, 15 years before I came to know the Lord. And so she was ahead of me in many ways as far as um, just basic spiritual disciplines. And so we're committed then to raise the kids, and then we have the kids, and now, now it's unfolding right before our eyes. If the Lord doesn't come back and the Lord blesses, we'll get to see, we'll have, we'll, we'll have great grandchildren. Our oldest grandchild is 11, and we're telling them, this is God's order. Uh, you come to know Christ, you graduate from high school, you, you go to college or graduate from college, you date a Christian girl, you marry the Christian girl, and then you have kids. Do we have the order right here? Kids, yeah, okay. So maybe in a dozen years, we'll have great-grandchildren. So, the, so, the, so the, I, Psalm 128 is like you throw this pebble, and what you do is going to matter for generations. It's going to have a ripple effect. My entire family on my side, nobody that I know of, nobody, that, none of them know Christ. Not one. Deb and I, and I have prayed for 41 years, that's the time that I've known the Lord. But Deb's side of the family, somebody threw the pebble in that pond, and it has rippled effects that come out through, it's, it gathered me up in those ripples, and now we, we have kids, and that's what, that's what the, this is. Just a funny little story in that I um, had a granddaughter who was not able to read yet, uh, so she was just looking at the pictures and telling me the story, but it was one of my storybooks about Jesus' birth. And so this um, little one who can't even read yet is, is telling the story, but in her own words because she can't read. And she's on the page where the angel is telling Mary that she is going to have a, a child and it will be Jesus. And she says, and the angel said to her, you are going to have a baby. It will be Jesus, the son of God. But 
you have to get married first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So understand the context of the passage. Okay, spend some time on Psalm 128, anywhere in the Bible. I'm going to hit this again right here. It starts with the Father. Now, some of you are in relationships or whatever, and the father's lagging behind spiritually. Maybe the, maybe the, maybe, maybe the husband isn't, isn't a believer or whatever, and, and, and moms are unbelievable. They pick up the slack. They did what, you know, Deb filled this gap that, that I left void. But God is always aiming for the father. So if you're here today, you know, God's aiming for you to take, uh, for you to take the lead. And I just want you to notice in Psalm 128, it talks about your wife being a, a fruitful vine. And up in verse 2, the word is used as well. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. And so, so this idea of fruit in the home is important. Now, we're doing a study at church at Lakeside here on the fruit of the Spirit. It's an unbelievable study. It's very challenging uh, personally. But I'm just going to have Deb read Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, which are the fruit of the Spirit. This is to be the environment of the home that your kids are being raised in. So just listen to the words. Very familiar. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Okay, so, so you'd want to ask the question, if our kids are old enough that they could be asked the question, do you see these fruits, the fruit of the Spirit, in your parents' lives? W what would they say? Would, would they, would, in the home, Create this environment where the fruit of the Spirit is just growing. Now, I want to point out, and I have a picture, in verse 3 of Psalm 128, uh, your wife will be like a fruitful vine, your children will be like olive shoots. I want you to underline that. I want you to just think for, think for a second on that. Now, I have a picture. And so the bottom picture is a picture that... Uh, that Deb and I took when we visited Israel in 2012. That's literally the Garden of Gethsemane. You can go there. It's walled off. They got past. Our group of 40 people had it blocked off for one hour where nobody, it's hustling and bustling all over. And we each got to go sit by an olive tree. That particular olive tree, there's no olive trees that are still left from the time that Jesus was there, but there's one that's like 15, 1600 years old. So an olive tree can go a long, long time. Um, I got a picture of the fruit of the olive off to the right, but off to the left, this is how olive trees do. They, they grow old in the main body there, you know, 800 years old, 900, but they have shoots. Other trees do this, but olive trees have shoots. And so, uh, so God is saying, Dave, you're an old guy. You're the old bark on the tree right here, but I've blessed you with a shoot. Your children are the, are the shoots. And so here's what I'd just like to remind us of this visual picture. Shoots are not yet mature branches, but will one day replace the parent branch, okay? One day you're off the scene and your kids carry the name, whatever. As shoots, our children require nurturing, care, pruning, and patience. Here's what I learned about the olive tree. It does not bear fruit overnight. As a matter of fact, the olive tree takes a long time to mature. The first three to 12 years, depending on the type of olive tree you plant, won't have any fruit appear at all. The first three to 12 years. Um, um, and then most olive trees will produce fruit in alternating years. They'll have a year where they have fruit. They'll have a year where there's no fruit. Think about your children. Have you seen some fruit? And then you're like, I thought they were just doing pretty good. And all of a sudden they go do this right here. And that's the olive tree. Um, full production of an olive tree where real fruit is growing never happens until for sure year five. And here's what Catherine Cheney, who's an expert in olive trees, she said it takes 65 to 80 years for stable, predictable fruit from an olive tree. So I'm like, wow, I'm 62, so it's time for me to start getting stable, I guess. Uh, 
And then God says in verse two, eat the fruit of your labor, no greater joy than your children walking in truth. It is worth all of the energy and all of the, all of the emotion. God's blessed you with these children. So we're just gonna just really quickly run down just a couple of things that we've did, done right. And we've kind of mentioned a number, a number of those uh, already. So I, I don't have them up here on the screen. You can just write them down. Number one, we, we've said this before, as we look back, we've prioritized the local church and the youth group, okay? We, yeah, so I, let me say one more thing and then I'll turn to Deb. We've been a part of four local churches and the reason why we, there's four because we moved. So we are part of Sailorville. Um, when I went to Bible college in Pennsylvania, we were a part of Summit Baptist Church. I pastored a church in Algona called Hillcrest Baptist Church and a part of this church. And so our kids have been raised in four churches and we have been completely, once we said this is our, it took us a couple months to find a church. Once we, once we said this is our church, we were all in. Our kids, our family, we were, so, so our kids will tell you some of, their, some of their lifelong friends are from the churches that we've been a major part of. It was hard for our kids to change, to go, like when we went to Algona, very difficult. Some of them were in high school, made, made the change, and God bless. But I, did I say what you were going to say, or do you have something to add there? Uh, just the importance of being in God's word. Um, yeah. God really impressed on me to read a proverb a day before they headed off to school. I did that for a period of time. Sometimes it was just a few verses here and there. Um, but I think the other thing that I did was... Um, uh, there's a resource, and it's listed in your booklets. It's you? the resource of um, Wise Words for Moms. I was going to have a copy of it with me here, and I forgot. Um, but this is a, it's not like a book you read. It's a chart. And this is not just for moms, even though it says Wise Words for Moms. It is for parents. Um, this chart is so practical to use God's word in correcting and disciplining your child um, so there'll, there'll be a list of um, disobedience that your child may have done. And then the next list is um, what's going on in their heart that caused this. And there'll be some, some suggestions there that give you good questions to ask your child so that you can expose to them what's going on in their heart. And then the next column is passages from God's word that show that the choice that they made was sinful and against God. And then the last column are um, verses to have your child go to and read so that they can choose the right thing going forward. Um, and so it, it's a great, great resource. Um, it's just so practical. It's one that you, you want to keep handy because you'll, you'll just reference it many times um, throughout your weeks and months. Um, but it's just extremely practical. And it, it kind of folds out like a calendar. You know how your calendar just flips up? And um, so, but it's, I, I highly recommend it. It's a great resource. I was looking it over and I realized that my wife has been using that on me over the last number of years. She'd point something out and it's like, hey, Dave, have you ever thought about this part of the heart attitude? And, you know, and I was, I was reading this verse the other day and it was the verse on the right column. It's like, oh yeah, you saw my, where I screwed up. You looked it up on your chart. And you're like, oh, okay, here we go. So it's, you can use it on your husband or your wife too. And so, but it is like an accident. And there's a, a lot of resource. That's a good one. Uh, we, we said this before, but things that we did right, we required our kids to say, please forgive me. We never allowed, I'm sorry. It's a small little thing, but it's a biblical word. The word... The word sorry is, in the original language, is really the word for making an apology, or I apologize. The word apology to, means literally to make a defense. Now, I know we don't use, so apologetics is you defend the faith. The word apology comes from the root word of to make a defense. So when you say, I apologize, uh, that, that, that's Satan's... Anyways, we, we always said, make our kids say, please forgive me. We'd, we'd face them up and do that. Um, we, we really worked hard at never excusing sin, even though, even though 
you're, you're, you're tired or whatever, we would never let them blame shift or making an excuse for sin. Um, one of our children uh, had a very easygoing temperament, but what they really were doing was holding everything in until they blew like a volcano. And when he blew like a volcano, he would hurt somebody. And as a preschooler, he knew when I heard you know, the loud slap or shriek and someone crying. When I said, what's happening back there? He knew, even as a preschooler, I did not want to hear his excuse. And so you would hear this little four-year-old voice say, I lost my temper. I, just teaching him that no matter what anyone else did, he was responsible for how he responded. So whatever a brother or a sister had done to him did not matter. What mattered was how he responded. And so to, don't, don't let them give excuses. Um, hold them responsible for the choices they make. It's like in the NFL when a couple players get in a fight, the last guy to throw the punch, he gets the yellow flag. And in parenting, that's that way a lot of times. You come in at the very end. And so we would often say, um, okay, well, we saw your behavior, so we're going to deal with that. Don't worry, we'll get to them in a minute, uh, but this doesn't, this doesn't excuse you. Here's, here's one that is absolutely, could, should be at the top of my, share, we shared our personal salvation testimonies over and over and over again with our kids. I know if you, if you were at Jason and Leah's thing, they talked about, well, dad was just so honest. Your, your kids, when they get to any kind of age, by the time they're nine or 10, they should be able to tell somebody how mom and dad came to know Christ. And so, so we, we use holidays. We'll, we'll have one of us uh, give a testimony. We'll have, uh, when we had grandma and grandpa that, that on Deb's side that knew them, we, we had a little vacation. We set them up. We set all the kids from all of the different families, and we asked grandma and grandpa to share their, t I want my kids to know how grandma and how Deb's mom and dad came to know the Lord, and I want our kids to know how we came to the Lord. Like, so we're constantly sharing our testimonies. We want them to know. Well, I, don't, I don't want them to, you know, to, to be at my funeral or something and hear somebody give a testimony testimony about my life and they, they didn't know what my they didn't know what my testimony was so we could go Saturday we had five grandchildren overnight and uh, on Saturday morning my husband took the two oldest grandsons for a, a drive and if any of you know my husband's testimony he was driving across Sailorville Dam when he was just overcome with the fact of I know what I need to do to be saved and and I haven't done it and he pulled over. They have those little pullovers where you can kind of look at the lake or look at the dam below. He pulled over up there and got out and knelt down on the rocks. And that's where he trusted Christ as his Savior. But a week ago, Saturday, he took our two oldest grandsons out there to the spot. And they thought that was so cool to hear about Grandpa trusting Christ and that it was right here that it happened. So it's powerful. Yeah, it was, it was a... How old were they? They were 11 and... They're 9 and 11. Yeah, 9 and 11. And it wasn't something planned. I was going to be going over there. And I was like, I should share with them. We got out of the car. And so Case is 9. He goes, I wonder if that one rock was the same rock that was there 41 years ago. <laughs> okay, maybe it was. <laughs> Grandpa, did you put your initials down there? Did you carve a cross in there? No, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. But they were like, this like... I said, yeah, I mean, like literally within five feet, that's where I was... Uh, kneeling right there. Um, we could say we, we only have a, a, a minute left. Intentional discipleship. Um, I, I do, l let me give you three more and I'm going to have Deb speak to, to one last one. Uh, teaching uh, respect and showing respect for authority. I mean, we, we honored police officers. We honored public servants. We honored authority uh, figures, whether we agreed with them or not. We had them, we would teach them to honor the president, you know, who are our senators, who are people in authority, and, um, and we wanted to honor them. Deb was really good about having good books and Bible truths. Um, Deb did a praise time, um, you know, at bedtime with the kids, and again, I missed out on some of this, uh, not, it's, it, I'm saying this to my, but Deb was really good about this. But here's the other thing, uh, Deb 
Deb taught, we taught our kids hospitality. So one of the things we did right is teaching our children hospitality. And, and explain what, what we, what we, yeah, it's on the last, explain kind of what we meant by that. So I grew, and then we, then we got to be done. I grew up in a home um, where I was taught hospitality and it was not entertaining guests. It was inviting 